Part 1. You will hear a woman telephoning a car hire company. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon, Baseline Car Hire. How can I be of assistance today? I've rented a car from your company in Edinburgh, and I would like to bring it back to you at your branch in York instead of Edinburgh. Can I have your name, please? Yes, it's Lauren Brady, B R A D Y. Thank you. I just need to get some more details from you, and I'll bring you up on the computer screen. Okay. What is your date of birth? Why do you need that? I just need some data to confirm I have the correct booking. Oh, fine. It's the 5th of the 11th, 1987. The 5th of November, did you say? Yes. Okay, you have a four-door diesel sedan that you picked up from the Edinburgh office on March 16th. Is that correct? Yes. I hired it for 7 days. Today is March 20th, so I have had it for 4 days. Okay, yes, I can see that you have hired it for 7 days and you have arranged to return it to the Edinburgh office on March 23rd. You want to change the drop-off location, did you say? Yes, I'm not returning to Edinburgh now, and I need to make a flight out of the country from London tomorrow, so I'm going to catch the train to London today. So, are you in York now? Are you catching the train from the station there? Yes, I'm catching the train this afternoon. I don't want to drive the car down to London as there are problems in the center of London and I don't particularly like driving in London traffic anyway. What problems? My hotel is in the center of London and I would have to pay the congestion charges. It's only 11 pounds 50. But there is the bother of paying it online and I just want to avoid all that. I understand. So what would you like to do with the car today? I'd like to leave it here and cancel the rest of my hiring days. I can arrange that for you. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. What time did you say you were catching the train to London? I couldn't get on an earlier train. They were all booked out. So I am catching one at 6 o'clock. Is there a place at the station where I can leave the car or do I have to bring it to your offices in York? No, not at all. You can leave it at the station in York. There is a drop-off point for all the car hire companies in the station car park. It should be manned at that time. What if there is no one there to take my car? That's not a problem. You just park the car in one of the bays with sign for baseline car hire, lock it and put the keys in the drop-off box. It's a secure blue container for people to put their keys. You can't miss it. Okay, I'll do that. I imagine there will be extra charges because I'm dropping the car off early. Yes, I'm afraid there are. Firstly, there is a 45 pounds charge for not taking the car back to where you hired it from. This is called the change in drop-off point fee. We only charge you for one extra day if you return the car early. You have had the car for 4 days and you have booked it for 7, 
so you will be charged a total of five days. That is £50 per day, including insurance. So for five days plus the £45 charge, that will be a total of £295. I see here that you are paying by credit card. That's correct. Now, remember, when you are returning your car, it needs to have a full tank or you will be charged for that as well. You mean I need to put petrol in the tank? Yes, the same level it was when you first drove away with it. I also suggest that you take photos of the vehicle to prove that it's not damaged when you drop it off, just as a precaution. Another tip is to send us an email after you have dropped the car off, just to confirm the time you have done it. I'm going to send you an email now to confirm the change in booking. Thank you very much. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a man talking about a new uniform for flight attendants. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. This is to let all flight attendants, male and female, know that from February we are introducing new uniforms. They have been designed by award-winning stylist Marsha Beecroft. Thank you everyone for responding to her request for suggestions on the situations where it was important to have different features incorporated into the uniform. You will be happy to know that Marcia Beecroft has taken your requests into account and you will see that many, or may I say most of them, and there were a lot of suggestions, have been used. Firstly, most requests were that all shirts, skirts and trousers should be made of stretch fabrics. We thought this was a great idea. Not only do these types of fabrics not require ironing and continue to look smart even throughout long flights, they are extremely comfortable. They are also good for when you are putting luggage up in overhead lockers, searching for objects on the ground and passing trays across rows of passengers. The only thing that we must make clear is that these items of clothing are not to be machine washed. They either need to be dry cleaned or hand washed. And this includes the shirts because the spin cycle weakens the fibers. The shirts will drip dry very quickly after hand washing. So this is actually a better option than the old uniforms, especially for when you are in transit and staying in hotels. There was also a request from the female flight attendants to have trousers included in the uniform. We consider this a good idea and now they can wear their dark blue suits as either skirt or trouser combinations with the jacket. You can see from this presentation that the colour scheme remains much the same as they have to come from our logo. The only difference being that the shirts are now light grey instead of yellow, which we think is more low-key. It was high time that we made the change. We think Marsha Beecroft has done a fantastic job and that the new uniforms are easy to look after and practical, as well as being professional. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
The changeover day for the new uniform is February the 1st. This week, everyone needs to submit their dress size to us so we can order the uniforms and have them ready on time. They should be available in the last two weeks of January. The form to fill in for this is on the company's staff website. Anyone who, as a result of not handing in their size requirements on time, does not have a uniform on February the 1st will be officially grounded and not fly until they have the correct uniform. You will be given three shirts, two jackets and three pairs of trousers or skirts, depending on what you have requested. There is no charge for these new uniforms, but replacement pieces will not be given out for one year unless they are paid for. No part of the old uniform can be worn from February the 1st. We have a recycling project for the old uniforms and there will be a bin positioned in the staff lounge at Heathrow Airport for you to put them in. Please put all your old uniforms in this bin during the first two weeks of February. I don't need to add that you need to wash them before they are put into the bin. The regulations for shoes remain the same, men in black lace-ups and women in pumps, with at least two inches of heel. I know many of you have requested having flat shoes like the men, but we think that a two-inch heel is a good compromise. Hair and makeup regulations remain the same, and the company lipstick is the only colour that can be worn. If you decide to wear a skirt... The rule remains at 15 denier flesh-coloured stockings. Hair must be up and off the face at all times, and, as with the past uniform, there are no hats. Men are still not allowed to have facial hair, and their hair must be cut short and also off the face like the women. If you would like to see the new uniforms up close before they are given out, there will be three shop dummies dressed in the new outfits in the staff lounge at Heathrow from next week. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You hear two students, Louisa and Michael, telling their tutor about an art exhibition they are putting on as part of a university project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. So, Louisa and Michael, how are your plans for the university art show going? This project makes up 80% of your mark for the event planning course. So, I hope everything is running smoothly. Have you had any problems, Louisa? Nothing we can't handle, but yes, even an event as simple as this one has had its problems. We had anticipated we might have some hiccups, particularly with the artists, and despite this, the show is going to open tomorrow. Just to give you a quick summary of what the art show is, we are having a one-week exhibition of works from university students who are artists. There are 30 paintings in the exhibition, and this evening they are going to be hung on the walls of the Anderson Room in the university's exhibition building. The show opens tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Thank you, Michael. How did you both decide who was going to do what in the organization of the exhibition? I'm in control of selection and logistics for movement of the artwork. And Michael has organized the event itself. I think it has been a quite even distribution of work. First, we decided on a theme for the exhibition together, which is Old Meets New. 
We found that the students in the Fine Arts Faculty have the greatest variation in age at the university, and we wanted to highlight this contrast. Their oldest student is 80. The students have been very enthusiastic about it. Were there any complaints that the theme was ageist? On the contrary, people thought it was age-inclusive. The university already has an exhibition for young artists, which excludes students over 40. How did you publicize the exhibition? I used social media and direct email to all fine arts students, asking them to submit digital images of their paintings. I also posted notices around the other faculties, hoping to attract any artists who were not studying fine arts. Did you? Just three engineering students. In all, we got 400 entries. From those digital images, we narrowed them down to the 30 we are showing. We only have enough space to hang that many paintings. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. How was the selection process made? We decided not to use any of the academic staff as judges to ensure impartiality, but asked three independent people to judge, a prominent art dealer and two established practicing artists. All three of them are graduates from this university. They made the exhibition selection from the digital images two weeks ago. They are coming in to the university this afternoon to decide on the winners. They particularly asked to be able to see the actual paintings before making a decision. So, we still don't know who the winners are. I understand why you didn't want the university staff judging it, but I think I should go along to the judging this afternoon to make sure everything runs smoothly. How are you paying for the exhibition? There have been very few costs. The hanging space has been offered to us for free and we have volunteers from the fine arts faculty who are helping to hang and take down the works. There will be some refreshments served at the opening, but these have been donated by a sponsor. Another thing, most of the artists have agreed to offer their paintings for sale, but we decided not to take a percentage from this. We thought that it would be just too difficult to manage the finances, and there was no need to fund anything anyway. If someone wants to buy a painting, they can deal directly with the artist. It sounds like it is all proceeding very well. Have you thought about what you will do if the artists don't collect their paintings when the show comes down? Yes, we are prepared for that. We have short-term storage space in the Fine Arts Department, the same space we have been keeping the paintings as they have arrived. The gallery space itself has to be cleared and cleaned within 24 hours, so we included a clause in the competition application form that states paintings must be retrieved within a 10-day period or they will be disposed of. Did you have a lawyer look at the terms and conditions before you posted them? Yes, Professor Watkins in the law faculty helped me write them from scratch. Excellent. And what is the prize for the competition? Just the glory, I'm afraid. We decided not to offer a cash prize. Professor Watkins said there would be less legal complications that way. Certificates will be awarded by the Vice-Chancellor of the University. She says that if the exhibition is a success, the University might hold it again next year. Well done! Let's meet again next week at the same time. But I'll be coming to the opening, of course. That is the end of Part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a part of a lecture about sharks. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. About 500 species of sharks exist today. Many of them look like the dorsal-finned, sharp-toothed predator that incites fear in most people's imaginations. But there are other species that resemble this idea less, with flatter, longer, or rounder body shapes that adapt them to the multitude of undersea environments. Evidence of fossils show that at one time there were more than three thousand different shark-like species that have their beginnings about four hundred and fifty million years ago, when there were few creatures in the sea and even fewer on land. It seems sharks arose from a group of fish called acanthodians, which looked much like the sharks of today but smaller. Their teeth grew in a similar way. A continual replacement process, starting off inside the mouth and not set in the jaw, growing forward, getting larger and larger. Sharks produce thousands of teeth during their lifetimes, with new teeth emerging every few days. The first fish that can be truly identified as sharks arrived about 50 million years later, in the early Devonian period, when most life on Earth was in the seas. This growing diversity of sea life led to the Devonian also being called the Age of Fishes. This first shark is called the Leonodus. Though little is known about it, due to only its teeth being found, it was more than likely eel-shaped and about forty centimeters long, and probably a member of a family of freshwater sharks. The study of shark evolution is almost completely based on the study of tooth fossils. From the teeth, we can ascertain where they lived, what they ate, and what other shark species they were related to, even today. Flatter teeth suggest a diet of crushing mollusks and crustaceans, while fine, pointy teeth are easier for catching fish. Sharks that eat large animals like seals have multiple rows of triangular, serrated teeth. A huge growth in the different varieties of sharks began about 360 million years ago during the Carboniferous period. The mass extinction that had occurred at the end of the Devonian period. Due to a combination of sea level and atmospheric gas changes, tectonic plate movement, and asteroid impacts had actually been beneficial to sharks. Many species disappeared, but those that survived had diversified under such environmental pressure. It was during this period that sharks got bigger, and many species grew to the size we know them today. During the Jurassic period, which started 200 million years ago, sharks with flexible jaws emerged. These jaws meant they were able to attack much larger fish, and their position as the great ocean predator became established. Different features began to emerge in the varied environments that we recognize as shark-like. Their snouts became more sensitive and began to protrude. A tail fin enabled them to swim faster for long distances to catch prey. The sharks that were thriving at this time continued well into the Cretaceous period, which ended 65 million years ago, when dinosaurs and many other animals were wiped out by an asteroid hitting the Earth. Sharks lived on by continuing to diversify. It was after this great extinction period that the largest number of new species appeared. 
The new families of sharks that emerged and survived this period were those that continued to develop into most of the shark species that exist today. They had survived some of the most devastating geological changes this planet has seen, and the result was a group of highly adapted predators at the top of the food chain. For the next 50 million years, there was little to stop them, but now they are under threat. Fishing, Pollution, climate change and habitat destruction all point to their possible demise. Humans kill enormous numbers of sharks that they fish for their meat and fins. Many are on the list of endangered species, particularly the whale shark and the great white shark, which are mainly caught for their meat. Deep-sea sharks are also at risk, as they can't reproduce fast enough to make up for their losses from being fished. They are sought after for their liver oil, which contains substances used in the cosmetic industry. Many shark species are not protected, which allows for their unlimited slaughter. Populations are being reduced at an extreme rate, and estimates show that a quarter of sharks are now threatened with extinction. Urgent action needs to be taken to promote population recovery. If this does not happen, the future of sharks is very uncertain. What was once the great survivor of the sea, continuing to exist for millions of years despite great natural catastrophes that killed off so many other animals, is now facing its greatest challenge. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.